Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Knox. I'm the director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities here at Case Western Reserve University. Um, the Baker Nord Center sponsors the Walter A. Strauss Lectures. Uh, in her first lecture on Monday, this year's Strauss Lecture, uh, Professor Priya Satya introduced us to the Galton family and the scandal of 1795 that erupted over this Quaker family's involvement um, in gun manufacturing. This evening, she turns to the ethical conflicts that arose during the development of a military surveillance system by the British in the Middle East between the World Wars. Now, here to say a few words to introduce our speaker um, is the newest member of CWRU's history department, Professor Ben Vinson. Professor Vinson is a distinguished historian of Latin America who joined our faculty just this summer. Oh, and uh, by the way, he's also our new provost. Please welcome him to the podium. Peter, I absolutely love that introduction. Uh, historian credentials first, I appreciate that. Um, a good afternoon once again, I am I'm Ben Vincent. I am the provost of, of Case Western Reserve University. And I'm tremendously pleased uh, to welcome you here uh, to the 2018 Walter A. Strauss Lecture by Professor uh, Priya Satya. Um, professor, uh, she's a professor, of course, of modern English history at Stanford University. Uh, I am tremendously excited about uh, this event, uh, first of all, because uh, uh, while I've had a, a good opportunity to really digest uh, over the past several months um, uh, this university and sampling all of its offerings and, and really meeting with faculty and staff and students and alumni, uh, university trustees uh, and members of the greater Cleveland community, it is an especially enjoyable uh, event for me to immerse myself uh, in the intellectual life uh, of Case Western Reserve University through a lecture such as this. Uh, of the many first impressions that I have had uh, in my three months here, I am absolutely thunderstruck by what I've been learning about the Baker Nord Center. The Baker Nord Center uh, for the Humanities serves, as a, serves a critical role here at, at Case Western Reserve University, elevating us to study, to reflect upon, to ponder elements that are deep at the core of the human tradition. And in no uncertain terms, uh, the Baker Nord Center is one of our signatures. Uh, it is our home that extols the arts and humanities. And I think we all recognize the centrality that the humanities has played over time in defining what it means to be an educated citizen and what it means to explore those timeless questions that deepen the horizons of our knowledge and, and that build us and build in us a capacity to reason better to wrestle with the great moral questions, and to clearly interrogate our future from what we draw from the past. Through its support of teaching, research, and other forms of scholarship and engagement, as well as its rich connections with our public and private partner institutions, the Baker Nord Center is not just an ambassador, but a very complement to the core mission of the Case Western Reserve University. It's because we strive to educate holistically, demanding excellence at every quarter, inspiring innovative and critical thinking that improves humanity along the way. Our Baker Nord Center helps us accomplish just that. And arguably, the humanities are more important now than ever. We are certainly living in, in a fast-moving society of profound technological and social change, a world that is rapidly altering the way we interface with one another. It is no secret, as Professor Gerald Greenberg from Syracuse uh, recently said, quote, leaders and decision makers who are able to employ a broader, more diverse range of ideas and knowledge will be better able to run businesses and governments and to react to difficult situations as they develop and arise. And certainly Harvard's president, uh, Drew Faust, has echoed these sayings through her quote, the humanities are such as important, or, or the humanities are such an important vehicle for widening the world, for teaching empathy for people outside of yourself. In these times, the humanities helps complete our ways of understanding and helps fulfill our education and inner promise. I can only imagine that all of you in the audience here tonight uh, agree, and I hope that we can continue as a community to make good use of this center, to participate in its lectures and its programs, and students, to take courses and perhaps even major or minor in these essential disciplines that, that will help guide, guide you into a deep understanding of the future 
it is a little known fact here that uh, at the Case Western Reserve University, 16% of our STEM graduates also have majors and minors in the humanities. The guidance offered by the humanities, available every day in our classrooms, begins anew tonight with a sparkling lecture from a brilliant scholar who will use history to help us understand how atrocities in many regions of this world continue to occur. Thank you. Without further ado, she needs no further introduction. Professor Priya Satya. Thank you so much for that introduction, Provost Vincent. Thank you, Peter, and thank you all for coming. And thank you to Case Western and the, the Baker Nord Center for having me out. It's been a great week. I hope this lecture sparkles. <laughs> um, let's see how it goes. Um, I'm not sure how many of you were here on Monday. OK, a fair number. OK, good. Um, so today we're sort of leaping across the 19th century and landing in the 20th century to see how British officials who professed genuine love for the Middle East came to invent a violent system of aerial policing uh, in Iraq after World War I with uh, really lasting and important legacies. Um, this aerial regime basically allowed violence to be committed with greater secrecy than before. Um, and it helped uh, this British regime in Iraq to, to evade the check of increasingly anti-imperial public opinion uh, coming out of Britain and Iraq and other places in the world. So the challenge for us is to understand how British officials reconciled their genuine ethical scruples with the actual violence of the policing system they created in the Middle East. So first, what we're going to do is see how the British dreamt up this system of aerial policing. And then we'll look at how officials defended it when it was criticized for its, for its uh, lack of efficiency and its inhumanity. So first, to orient us. This is, um, Iraq is made up of three former provinces of the Ottoman Empire, which are marked here, OK? Um, and Britain occupied these three provinces during the course of World War I. Uh, in that war, Britain and the Ottoman Empire were on opposite sides. So to secure the loyalty of people who lived here, the British promised them that they would have a free country after the war. But in fact, Britain was determined to hold on to this region because um, it was felt to be crucial to the security of imperial air routes, land routes, um, even sea routes, and oil resources. So these wartime promises um, and the growth of anti-imperial sentiment all around the world meant, though, that they could not just simply call Iraq a colony once the war was over. They had to sort of dress it up in more respectable clothes. So there's this new body for international governance created after World War I, the League of Nations, and it included a mandate system by which um, some kind of uh, less advanced but newly freed country was assigned to sort of uh, tutelage for an unknown duration under a more advanced power, right? So Iraq becomes a British mandate territory, OK? Now, Iraqis knew that this was just colonialism by another name. And they were disappointed. And they were also living for many years under this very difficult, long, violent uh, military occupation. So they rebel uh, in mass numbers uh, after this announcement uh, in 1920. And at that very moment, the British were also facing mass resistance in Egypt and India and Ireland and all over. So the empire's overstretched. And they're fumbling for some kind of creative solution to this problem. So in 1921, the colonial secretary, who's Winston Churchill, he calls a conference in Cairo. And I'll just show you a picture of Churchill. Anyone know who else is there? There's T.E. Lawrence and Gertrude Bell, you know, going out to see the Sphinx. Okay. So they're out in Cairo for this conference. And it's decided in this conference to establish a British-backed monarchy in Iraq and to police Iraq from the air with this new military service that's going to be christened the Royal, air, the Royal Air Force, the RAF. So the RAF is going to patrol the country and coordinate information collected by agents on the ground in order to bomb uh, or discipline villages and tribes uh, with bombs. Uh, 
So in, it's in Iraq that the British, act, the British come to actually rigorously practice the technology of bombardment as a permanent method of everyday colonial administration. And it's there that they fully uh, theorize the value of air power as an independent arm of the military. Now, air control was cheap. And this is uh, sort of a cartoon making fun of the, the initial drain of uh, public resources in setting up this new colony. There was a lot of criticism in the British public about adding yet another burden to the empire. But more than that, the British felt that uh, air control was particularly suited to Iraq, right? If it was about cheapness, you would see air control being used everywhere, right? But they only use it in Iraq. And T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, who is a main figure behind the scheme, he insisted that this scheme is, quote, not capable of universal application. To him and other experts on the Middle East, aerial control made sense in Iraq for sort of aesthetic and um, kind of pr and practical reasons combined. So what they thought was that this theoretically panoptical uh, power that air, air control had would solve the peculiar information problems that they tended to associate with the Middle East generally, and I'll talk about those in a minute. And they also presumed that the infrastructural austerity of air control would be ideal for a land that they imagined as a sort of vast, empty, flat, desert, so power could just radiate in all directions, but according to theory. Now, of course, Iraq is actually a very topographically diverse country. Let me just show you a few quick pictures that are from a later period, but just to remind it, so we don't fall into the trap of imagining it the way the British did. These are the marshy areas. There are mountains, green areas near the rivers, different kinds of desert. It's not all flat, rocks. This is sort of, it's neither land nor river. I mean, it's mush, okay. So just to give you a sense. So when British officials actually had to confront this reality, they would spin it as proof that Iraq was the perfect laboratory for air power, because you could use air power on every kind of terrain. And I mean, there's a total cognitive dissonance there, but they, they, they lived with that. They were simply too taken by the notion of, quote, uh, the natural fellow feeling between nomad Arabs and the Air Force, both being in conflict with the vast elemental forces of nature. So the Arabs and the desert and the pilots and the sky. Okay. So in short, there are cultural reasons related to British imaginings about the region why this unprecedented scheme was first devised in Iraq. Later, after it was deemed a success in Iraq, air control was used elsewhere. And by that time, experts were saying it's absurd to think that some peculiar quality about Iraq uh, meant aircraft could do things there that it could not do elsewhere. But what we're after today is the power of that original contention that Iraq was peculiarly suitable to air control, because that's what gave air control a place, a space in which to become normalized and then applied elsewhere. So first we need to get at the origins of these ideas about Iraq. So we have to go back in time a little. So British in, um, surveillance, intense surveillance of the Middle, this Middle Eastern region began before World War I um, with the purpose of keeping an eye on growing German interest in the region and new nationalist movements that were coming up inside the Ottoman Empire. Now Britain and the Ottoman Empire were formerly allies, so this intelligence had to be gathered by informal agents, like journalists, military officers on leave, archaeologists, um, sometimes diplomats, so they're not sort of professional agents. Um, now these agents would complain often of the difficulty of gathering intelligence in this mysterious land. They described it as a land, this is this intelligent agent writing, a land peopled by the spirits of the Arabian Nights, where little surprise would be occasioned in seeing a genie floating out of a magic bottle. Many of them said they felt transplanted to the moon. Cartography was so challenging in this apparently featureless, horizonless, protean, mirage-ridden desert that these dreamy and distracted agents often had great difficulty simply determining where they were. They would send in reports where they would say, I don't know where I was, but. So they concluded this was in a, you know, a serious uh, uh, journal article in a geographical journal, um, a geo geographer wrote, this region is, quote, very much the same everywhere. <laughs> 
And they found the people equally elusive. One agent warned, one cannot believe a word one hears. But Arabia, which is how they referred to this kind of geographic and cultural imaginary, did seem to possess certain virtues lost to Britain in this moment. Many of these agents were drawn to the work as a means of venturing to an antique and romantic land under cover of patriotic duty, hoping to, quote, step straight from this era, excuse me, step straight from this modern age of bustle and chicanery into an era of elemental conditions back into the pages of history to medieval times. So they're romanticizing themselves as much as they romanticize Arabs, and they see the desert as a haven for people who prize liberty, right? So, and this was also one of the few places that the Royal Geographical Society termed still unknown, with a capital S, capital U. Um, and so Arabia also seemed to offer the chance to enact a kind of heroic pioneer type of Victorian exploration which doesn't, is not, none of this is very conducive to discretion and secrecy, which we typically associate with intelligence gathering. Um, so as one agent explained, you know, the, the ethic of uh, intelligence gathering in the Middle East was just different. Crossing the Mediterranean, he wrote, one enters a new realm of espionage full of Eastern cunning and subterfuge in which the spy no longer emerges bogey-like as in the West. So the agents experienced intelligence gathering in the Middle East as entry into an almost fictional world. And this was the very moment in which the genre of spy fiction was really coming to, into its own as well. They were deeply conscious of working in the land of the Bible and the Odyssey, where espionage had always been an integral part of the epic struggle for self-knowledge. Um, and so they were self-consciously following uh, the hero of a very popular novel at the time. Um, Oh, excuse me, I forgot to show you this earlier. This is a painting from 1990. It just shows the romance of flight over the desert, right? So Kim, right, came out right at the turn of the century. Kim is both a spy and a spiritual disciple. And the picture here in the middle is John Philby, who is one of the agents in this community of Middle East spies. Um, and he, he was so taken with this book that he named his son Kim Philby, who you may have heard of as one of the Soviet moles known as the Cambridge Five who come out in the Cold War. So he is sort of being framed by this moment in, in Middle Eastern intelligence. If you haven't read this novel, students, you have to read this novel, okay? It's required before you graduate, all right. So they're trying to be like Kim, you know, be a spy and a spiritual disciple at the same time. In the desert, faith, if not facts or visual data, seemed a reasonably practical objective. So unlike earlier generations of Orientalists, they embraced a kind of anti-empirical outlook based on notions of a shared past and even sometimes racial affinities with uh, Middle Easterners. Travel in Arabia numbed the senses, they said, but it also allows one to see, hear, and feel outside the senses. So interest in Arabia was part of a fascination with mysticism and occultism at the turn of the century that was being shaped by you know, scientific revelations of invisible forces like electromagnetic forces and things like that. Um, so the apparent limitations on empirical intelligence gathering in the Middle East opened the door to spies who were willing, like avant-garde philosophers and artists to experiment with new types, new theories of perception, and new, perhaps more unscientific ways of knowing. So as a basis of knowledge, faith seemed to at once uh, seem capable of sort of solving um, agents' uh, intelligence gathering difficulties, but also it could also at once soothe their spiritual cravings that are motivating them to go out to the Middle East. To them, Arabia, of all magical places, was the place for miraculous conviction. As one spy wrote, the desert is of God, and in the desert no man may deny him. This was, after all, the birthplace of the three monotheistic religions launched by visionary prophets. So to this generation of Britons, Arabia was a biblical homeland to which they might return to find that perfection of mental content that they felt Arabs alone seemed to possess. So primitivism and this admiration for Arabs was trendy, even if it was also obviously very racist, okay? So Arab wisdom, they said, was intuitive rather than intellectual. It's beyond scientific check, like everything in Arabia. 
So as one agent said, the European thinks, the Oriental only reflects, and the idea turned over and over endlessly becomes part of the fiber of his mind. So this is the product of place as much as race. Another uh, writer, a uh, writing agent said, in desert countries, the essential facts sink into you imperceptibly until they are woven into the fibers of your nature. So you don't need to be empirical. You will just know things automatically in the desert. So British agents invented an intelligence strategy for Arabia that prioritized knowledge acquired through intuition uh, rather than sense data, and they stipulated lengthy immersion in the region as the way to, to, to have this ability to, to know it intuitively. By intuition, they meant the acquired ability to think like an Arab, an empathetic mimicry of what they called the Arab mind. For, they said, only by, quote, only by Orientals or by those whose long sojourn in the East has formed their minds after the Oriental pattern can the Orient be adequately, adequately described. So here's one uh, agent's way of putting this. They determined to merge in the Oriental as far as possible, to absorb his ideas, see with his eyes, hear with his ears, to the fullest extent possible to a, a British person. So what made an expert on Arabia expert was his ability to see, like Arabs presumably did, beyond surface deceptions, to discern the real from the real, the mirage, uh, the real from the mirage, the real from the lie, right? So knowing Arabia was a matter of genius, intuitive genius. As one agent put it, book knowledge mattered little. We sensed the essence of a matter. So the gifted few claimed a kind of omniscience about this region. And at the outbreak of war, since they're geniuses, right, they become indispensable. And they exercise a great deal of influence on the, the Middle East campaigns of the First World War, including the innovative use of air power for all kinds of purposes, in mapping, transportation, communication, and in bombardment uh, as well during the war itself. And it was with their help, as we saw uh, of the, the picture with, of Churchill and Gertrude Bell and T. E. Lawrence, that um, Churchill gets approval of this air control scheme in 1921. So what was the scheme? The RAF scheme eventually consisted of eight squadrons of fighters and light bombers, four armored car units, and several thousand Iraq levy troops. Army garrisons were gradually reduced to protect only the nine air bases laid out on the land, which were equipped with wireless telegraphy. So in a single two-day operation, a squadron might drop several dozen tons of bombs and thousands of incendiaries and also fire thousands of rounds of small arms ammunition. So now I'm just going to show you a few images from this time period to give you a sense of what the scheme was like. So this is the uh, main aerodrome outside of Baghdad. It's still uh, the big, I mean, the US military air base was also there. Um, this is uh, a lineup of some bombers right there at that airfield. Um, 1926, some, some aircraft flying over that uh, same air base. Slightly later period, flying over the Euphrates. This is over the Kurdish area where you have mountains. And you know, this is the, the myth that they're doing this over uninhabited areas. This is um, over Mosul, a city in the north. And now the next three uh, are showing you a bombing. So first, a 500-pound bomb is dropped. Suleimania is in the Kurdish area. And then another bomb is dropped the next day. And then this is the after effect. So did this scheme work? No. <laughs> the regime was plagued by reports of visibility problems, pilot disorientation, and often instances of, quote, inexplicable, inexplicable failures to identify tribes on the move. Aircraft often made demonstrations over and bombed the wrong town and the wrong tribe. And Iraqis did find cover to hide from the bombs in watercourses and hillocks and other features of what the British saw as a featureless landscape. But in an amazingly deceptive, in an infamously deceptive land, all this inaccuracy was dismissed. Assessing the effect of bombing was, bombing was considered guesswork. This man, who was the head of political intelligence at the time, he explained that, like all information in the region, complaints about observation failures were exaggerated. 
Mirage, after all, would prevent anyone from on the ground from judging pilots fairly. Um, and in any case, it didn't matter if they were accurate because aircraft were meant to be everywhere at once, quote, conveying a silent warning. So proponents of air control, like Arnold Wilson, frankly admitted that terror was the underlying principle of the scheme, and they used that word terror. And it was based on this presumed Arab propensity for exaggeration. The idea was where there was one plane, Arabs would spread rumors of dozens of planes. Uh, if there were a few casualties, this would instill fear of hundreds of casualties. So air control would work like a panopticon. An official memo from the Air Ministry explained, from the ground, every inhabitant of a village is under the impression that the occupant of an airplane is actually looking at him, establishing the impression that all their movements are being watched and reported. So if pilots couldn't be sure whether they were looking at warlike or peaceful tribes, Bedouin, Arabs on the ground, would also not be able to discriminate between a bombing expedition and a reconnaissance expedition, and that was fine. Right? So air control was pronounced a success. In its Iraqi cocoon, the RAF was safe from criticism. It was protected by the notorious fallibility of all news emerging from Arabia. So terror was interestingly also held up as proof of the regime's humanity. In theory, air power would bloodlessly awe tribes into submission or interference with daily life through destruction of homes, villages, crops, and livestock would produce that result. But in fact, of course, the system's inhumanity lay in its inability to distinguish between combatants and non-combatants, whether destroying their possessions or their, their lives. And uh, early Air Force statements acknowledged that the regime's moral effect depended on demonstrations of exemplary violence, which could hardly be accomplished without serious loss of life. So in fact, the pacification, in quotes, of Iraq proved horrifically costly in Iraqi lives. Um, it seems that 100 casualties was not unusual in a single operation besides those who would be lost to starvation and the burning of villages. Whether attacking British communications or refusing to pay taxes at crushing rates or harboring uh, wanted rebels, many tribes and villages were bombed into submission. As you can imagine, critical voices started to emerge even in Britain. The new war sec secretary wrote, Witheringly, if the Arab population realized that the peaceful control of Mesopotamia, that's how Iraq was referred to in this time, depends on our intention of bombing women and children, I'm very doubtful if we shall gain that acquiescence of the fathers and husbands of Mesopotamia to which Churchill looks forward, right? Now, Air Ministry memoranda responded to this critique, and they said, well, don't you know, quote, all war is not only brutal, but indiscriminate in its brutality. And they point to the effects on civilians of things like naval bombardment, trampling by armies, blockading, shelling, and so on. And at least, they said, the lives of attackers are safer this way. So they're speaking as unsentimental realists, and they actually tout the, quote, great humanity of bombing, since however appalling and ghastly it was, it also lowered enemy casualties by forcing them to give up sooner in the face of, quote, continual unending interference with their normal lives. So to be sure, we, you can see that World War I had clearly shifted notions about humanity and warfare. Uh, to a lot of military thinkers, the goal was to minimize casualties as a whole rather than civilian deaths in particular, since modern combatants were really just civilians putting on a uniform overnight, right? Um, but the air staff really still did not address the concerns of those who may have been equally offended by the general brutality of modern war, or those who might rightly have considered aerial bombardment in its all-seeing omnipotence perhaps more terrible than those other kinds of uh, brutal um, techniques, like blockading and so forth. But most saliently, there's these counterexamples, like naval bombardment, blockades, and so on, these are all wartime measures, right? And the air staff was supposed to be discussing bombing as a peacetime security measure, as a policing technique, an everyday technique. What was permissible only in wartime in other countries turned out to be always permissible in Iraq. <laughs> 
And that permissiveness drew on the experts' ideas about Arabia, that this was a mystical and romantic land beyond the pale of worldly and bourgeois convention, a place of honor, bravery, and perennial conflict. One uh, RAF intelligence officer, who you may have heard of, he's quite well known, John Glubb, insisted, quote, life in the desert is a continuous guerrilla warfare. You have to strike hard and fast because that is the way of Bedouin war. For Bedouin, war was a romantic excitement. Its production of tragedies, bereavements, widows, and orphans was a, quote, normal way of life, natural and inevitable. Their appetite for war was what made Bedouin feel like elites of the human race. Now, in this view, it would almost be a cultural offense not to bomb them. Right? So as knights of the air, aircraft had also brought some chivalry back into vulgarized modern warfare. Now Arnold Wilson, that uh, head of political intelligence, he echoed these ideas and said that Iraqis were used to constant warfare. They expected harsh justice. They had no patience with sentimental distinctions between combatants and non-combatants. And they viewed air action as legitimate and proper. The former chief of air staff, Hugh Trenchard, who was sort of the head of this whole air control scheme, uh, later on assured Parliament, and this was in 1930, he said in Parliament, quote, the natives of these tribes love fighting for fighting's sake. They have no objection to being killed. It's, it's really hard not to laugh. Go ahead. Um, in a place uh, romanticized as an, as an oasis of prelapsarian egalitarianism and liberty, these defenders of air control could rest assured that Bedouin retained their dignity even under bombardment, and they didn't need the condescension of humanitarian pity. So a British commander assured, Iraqi sheikhs do not resent that women and children are accidentally killed by bombs. But T.E. Lawrence, who here he is in his oriental garb, he added that, you know, this may be difficult to understand. This is too oriental a mood for us to feel very clearly, right? In 1932, uh, Iraq joined the League of Nations as a nominally independent country. I'll we'll talk about that a little more later. But the RAF remained in, in actual control on the logic that, quote, the term civilian population has a very different meaning in Iraq from what it has in Europe. There are no civilians in Iraq. So this was a population, to the British, this was a population at once so orientally backward and so admirably martial that you know, in this post-war society that's increasingly into ideas of cultural relativism as well, all principles of justice in war were sort of irrelevant. The austerity of tribal life, which was imagined to encompass all Iraqis, uh, rendered even concern about the loss of property irrelevant, despite the deliberate targeting of things like livestock and homes. Moreover, data was so elusive in Arabia that there was little point in worrying about who was killed. So Middle East experts sitting in the colonial office said that, quote, bombs dropped on men in the open seldom have much effect beyond fright, and casualty observations were always misleading. So in, in short, willful ignorance about outcomes in Iraq made air control sit more easily in the British official mind. Only in Arabia, about which the British had long decided that nothing could ever be really known, did such fecklessness make sense and thus make air control acceptable. Now, Arabia's biblical past was also held to make air control uniquely acceptable there. In 1932, the inhumanity of air control was under discussion at the World Disarmament Conference in Geneva. And the British High Commissioner in Iraq was there. And he explained that Iraqis actually looked at, saw bombing as, quote, an act of God to which there is no effective reply but immediate submission. And Lawrence agreed that it's something seen as impersonally fateful, not punishment, but a misfortune from heaven striking the community. In short, Arabia was a biblical place, and the people who lived there knew that. They expected periodic calamity and divine, inter divine visitation. So air control played on Arabs' presumed fatalism, their presumed faith in the incontrovertible will of God. The idea was that such people could bear random acts of violence in a way that Europeans, coddled by secular notions of justice and human rights, could not. And as a biblical space, Arabia was also understood by the British to be beyond the realm of ordinary mortal law. 
So something recalling sort of a storybook age of chivalry in England. So according to Glubb again, uh, he said Bedouin possessed, quote, depths of hatred, reckless bloodshed, lust of plunder of which our lukewarm natures seem no longer capable, deeds of generosity worthy of fairy tales, and acts of treachery of extraordinary baseness. Their love of dramatic actions outweighed the dictates of reason, even overcame the inherent dislike of being killed. So the transposition of real Arabia into a storybook land made bombing acceptable to those who believed they would object to it in any other context. The vindication of air control did not rest merely on a racist dehumanization of Arabs. It also grew out of long, circula long circulating ideas about Arabia as a place exempt from the this-worldliness that constrains human activity everywhere else. There, here in Arabia, heroes could reach exalted heights and villains profound depths. There, as in books and stories, agents could escape from the pitiful reality of human suffering into an exalted sphere in which everything possessed a kind of cosmic significance. So here's just one story like that. Sheikh Dari, pictured here, was killed, uh, sorry, he killed uh, Captain Leachman, the political officer, uh, during the 1920 rebellion. And he was the single exception to the general amnesty granted to rebels after the rebellion was put down. And that is, I think, because he was not seen as a member of that wider uprising, but as someone who had violated the honor between two men. So the rebellion was sort of reconfigured as an episode of medieval battle in which the Medal of Chivalric Men was tested and rewarded. So bombardment was thus acceptable even to uh, British uh, experts on Arabia who were enchanted with notions of Arabian liberty. They loved Arabia for its otherworldliness, and it was precisely that otherworldliness that also made it to, to them seem fit to bear the unearthly destruction of bombers, as if it was an entirely distinct moral world. Now, the Arabian window of acceptability opened the door to wider uses of aerial bombardment. In 1921, the air staff said it was impolite, it was, excuse me, said it was that they must avoid, this is all quoted, avoid emphasizing the truth that air warfare has made distinctions between military and civilian targets obsolete and impossible. It may be some time until another war occurs, and meanwhile, the public may become educated as to the meaning of air power. So Iraq offered a means of selling this new warfare by exhibiting it in a famously romantic place where the now bankrupt laws of humanity and warfare were known not to apply anyway. It worked. British bombs soon fell all over the world, as we know. And the gruesome relish in a 1920 report by one squadron officer in Iraq is illuminating in this regard. He wrote, the Arab and Kurd now know what real bombing means in casualty and damage. They know that within 45 minutes, a village can be practically wiped out and a third of its inhabitants killed or injured by four or five machines which offer no real target, no glory, and no effective means of escape. This is Arthur Harris, who is the head of Bomber Command in World War II. He's known as Bomber Harris. And he was the man behind the firestorms of uh, Hamburg and Dresden. So ideas about Arabia exonerated air control from charges of inhumanity. But amazingly, the regime's reliance on intelligence officers on the ground actually allowed it to project an actively humane image as well. So the supposed intuitive understanding of these agents on the ground um, carried within it a claim to an empathetic style of colonial control. Now, from the outset, the intelligence community, those experts, agreed that even though the Air Force is in charge, they would still need these gifted men who, quote, have the Middle East, the feeling of the Middle East in their blood, people like T.E. Lawrence on the ground helping the aircraft. And the RAF agreed that it wanted those men on the ground, uh, partly to cope with those unexpected visibility problems. So it raises this set of special service officers, SSOs. And they learn the same techniques as the earlier um, generation of uh, intelligence officers. So they too say it's all about intuitive ability and canny knowledge of, of custom, because uh, you're going to be engaging with tribesmen who, this is Glob's words, tribesmen who deem it a duty to receive and welcome a guest, although he's mapping their villages with a view to bombing them and tells them so. Right. So the new agents claim also that you know long immersion is what enables them to actually interpret the Arab's mind. <clears throat> 
and the RAF comes to trust them to sense impending, impending events. So in many cases, successful bombardment was credited to the genius of these agents on the ground, and they're communicating through wireless technology with, uh, um, with the aircraft. Now, defenders of air control noted that far from render, rendering British rulers aloof, aircraft actually allowed them to roam more freely and thus facilitated greater intimacy with Iraqis. At the same time, it was this mobility that ensured that aircraft were able to pick out the right villages to hit. So by this logic, the, air, the, aircraft, uh, the RAF's successful persecution of a village testified to British intimacy with its Iraqi subjects. Indeed, a claim to empathy underwrote the entire system with that authoritative reassurance that bombardment was a tactic that would be understood and respected and even expected in this land. So a year before the Iraqi revolution of 1958 finally ended this air control uh, regime, the British Air Marshal Sir John Slessor was still defending the regime by noting the approval of special service officers who knew the place best and were, quote, so attached to their tribesmen that they sometimes almost went native. Into the 80s, John Glubb insisted, the basis of our desert control was not force, but persuasion and love. In 1989, a military historian cited Glubb to vindicate this regime again because, quote, no European was ever closer and more sympathetic to the Arabs than Glubb. And then at the start of, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to show you. This is just a poster for one of those uh, pageants that the Air Ministry put on to, to make, uh, it's a propaganda event to get people excited about air control in the Middle East. So this is a quote from 2003 the start of uh, the American war in Iraq with an American captain defending harsh security measures by saying, you have to understand the Arab mind. The only thing they understand is force, right? That same confidence in I know the Arab mind. But of course, the claim to empathy was built literally on sand. From its turn of the century invention as an intelligence epistemology, it had signaled not recognition of common humanity, but a British effort to transform the self to cope in what they felt was a radically different physical and moral universe. Post-war agents also, who you know, inspired very much by those earlier uh, agents like T.E. Lawrence and Gertrude Bell, they were still trying to go out to the Middle East to escape the bonds of too much civilization, to recover a noble spirit lost to bourgeois Britain, to go to a fictional, biblical, uncanny, um, enchanted, magical place, right? They too saw desert travel as an escape, um, a kind of truant fulfillment of patri patriotic duty, a kind of exit from the customary world. And the RAF itself compounded that feeling of being in a world apart. Its tenuous links to civilization through this seemingly magical wireless infrastructure and the rumors of Lawrence uh, being in the ranks of the RAF fed that Arabian mystique. And it was true. I mean, T.E. Lawrence signed up for the RAF and he was posted to uh, sort of present day Afghanistan. So if flight over um, biblical terrain was sublime, it also, quote, produced a bad effect on one's nerves, a feeling that the end of the world had really come, said one pilot. Pilots knew, quote, that, knew that air of quiet weariness that comes to those who have been in the desert too long and makes them go mad. So this was not a place for empathy, but for total psychic breakdown if you didn't have some kind of bracing. And I think that bracing was, um, you know, that, that set of ideas about, um, about Arabs and Arabia. And emulation of Arabs was intended to enable British survival in this extraterrestrial space. It did not produce compassion for the victims of the surreal world of bombardment that the British actually, actually created by pulling the strings of fate from the sky. And that's how Iraq actually did become a place that was beyond the reach of secular and humanitarian law. So as I mentioned earlier, in 1932, the air staff ensured uh, the, the Iraq becomes a nominally independent member of the League of Nations. But at that point, the air staff uh, is very clear that the change is going to be, quote, more apparent than real. And despite Iraqi objections, they insist that the special service officers, that the aircraft, the wireless tanks, uh, intelligence sources, all of those remain in British hands out of the control of this 
the new Iraqi army. And the British High Commissioner continues to hold a right of intervention, and British officials are there to ensure that this independent Iraqi government still conforms to British priorities. And the Air Ministry defends these continuities in Parliament by explaining you know, that this is, quote, an oriental country where intrigue is rife. But of course, they're the ones doing the intriguing, right? Um, and privately, they actually concede. I found this uh, in one minute on uh, in, in an Air Ministry file that we really have no defense. So they knew what they were doing. So air control was a mechanism of control for a region in which more overt colonial con rule was a political impossibility. As the Air Ministry explained, quote, in countries of this sort, the impersonal drone of an airplane is not so obtrusive as soldiers. Air control allowed covert pursuit of empire in an increasingly anti-imperial world. Its cheapness and discretion allowed it to elude the check of British taxpayers. This, this was a new mass democracy after the First World War. They're eager to control foreign policy, but the state's closeted reliance on these experts, its refusal to gather statistics on casualties, its refusal to publicly decorate Air Force men from Iraq, the censorship, the restrictions on travel to the Middle East, all of this is intended to keep Iraqi affairs on the down low, right? Uh, the more this British mass democracy is asserting itself, the more the state is finding ways to keep foreign policy, and especially Iraqi policy, out of its reach. Meanwhile, the Air Ministry launches a propaganda campaign with these air demonstrations, recruitment tours, lectures, books and articles, exhibitions, and so on, to impress the public with the romance of the aerial regime in Iraq. And I think this is where I wanted to show you this picture. I'm sorry, that was out of order. So enough people were convinced, enough consciences were soothed that this regime could last for the entire interwar period. At the same time, though, the continued presence of the RAF in Iraq compromised the legitimacy of that post-1932 so-called independent Iraqi government. And throughout this period, aerial policing never created a peaceful situation. There was always insurgency, because the presence of the British, however discreet it was, was still a provocation, right? So Iraqis knew that not much had changed after 1932, and they were right, because the British swiftly reoccupied the country in World War II. Um, so finally, in 1958, there's a revolution that finally overthrows the British-backed monarchy in Iraq. But just two years later, having learned a great deal from the British intelligence establishment through collaboration during World War II and the Cold War, the CIA begins its interventions in Iraq by attempting to assassinate the new Iraqi head of state. So I'll have more to say about America in a minute. But hypocrisy, this is obvious. There's a lot of hypocrisy here, right? But hypocrisy is a helpful description of what's going, but it, going on, but it's not a very good um, explanation of what's going on for why liberal empire is the way it is, right? So instead, what I've tried to do here is to uncover the cultural mechanisms that enabled the British official mind uh, to invent and implement the world's first air control regime with mostly clear conscience and even with a confidence in a kind of consistent paternalism. The idea of Arabia circulated by British agents over the, a couple of decades by the time uh, air control started provided uh, British officials with a key to evading all charges of brutality, inhumanity, and hypocrisy. So before closing and taking your questions, I just want to give you a little note uh, that brings us a little bit to, into the more recent past. Now, as I said, um, the American military establishment absorbed a lot of these myths that were so actively propagated um, uh, about British air control by the British government. And T.E. Lawrence remained and remains a sort of indispensable guide to working with Arabs uh, in American military training establishments. So it's perhaps no surprise that in 2003, the Pentagon began to dream of replacing American troops in Iraq with air power that could, quote, strike everywhere and at once. And indeed, in 2008, it launched a secret program that put hundreds of surveillance and attack drones in orbit over Iraq and then later Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, the very same places where Br the British used air control. And here's just uh, a picture of a drone. Uh, 
Now, generalized terror remains the tactical foundation of the strategy. Uh, enthusiasts um, behind this drone scheme praise the uneasiness produced by drones, quote, persistent stare ca capability. And there's plentiful evidence of Iraqi fear of these drones. Drone use increased despite condemnations by the UN Human Rights Council under President Obama. And it's important to remember that memory of the past, memory of the British era, shaped the Iraqi response to this American aerial strategy. So Colonel David Kilcullen, who was um, a senior counterinsurgency advisor to General Petraeus, recognized and said publicly that people in this region see drones as neo-colonial. And I think that's a framing that um, Americans don't have as strongly as, as Iraqis do. So I'll stop there, and thank you for listening. And I'm looking very much forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much for that. If uh, you do have questions, please um, let me know, and I will um, bring the microphone over to you so everyone can hear the question. Thank you. Um, I'm very interested in your presentation, and I'd like to say that it rather differs from uh, presentations what one sees elsewhere. I'd like to read to you a statement. How did air policing work? Referring, of course, to the Royal Air Force in Iraq. If a local political officer reported a disorder that was beyond their control, the offenders would be summoned to appear for trial in a court of law. If they refused or continued criminal activities, a warning was dropped telling them that unless they submitted, the village would be bombed or blockaded by air until the required so submission was forthcoming. An aircraft would duly appear on the stated date and bomb the village. This continued until the submission was obtained. The villagers already at poverty level could not afford to have their routine interrupted and would pressure the offender to submit. Once the offender had surrendered, the police or troops, supported by medical personnel, would be flown in to restore order, tend to the sick and wounded, and help restore the village to a habitable standard. After the system had been enforced for some time, a mere threat of action was usually enough to persuade the offenders to turn themselves in. Um, a big airlift involving Assyrian refugees was carried out in September 1933, where 790 people, mostly women and children, were flown from the north, where they had suffered fearful massacres at the hand of Muslim fanatics and the Iraqi army. So it doesn't seem as if the Iraqis were great people themselves. Do we believe that the Brits actually did indeed send in medical personnel and give a warning, which is hardly what I would describe as brutal. It's not, not pleasant, I grant you, but I wouldn't call it brutal. Would you like me to respond? Um, I don't think any government that relies on bombing as a policing strategy is not brutal. Right? Um, and on the, the stuff about warnings, <laughs> um, the, the warnings and the leaflets, yes, that's all part of the formal process and theory. It's not clear that that was routinely carried out. Yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, that's, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you, though. Yes, uh, yes, uh, yes, I have, uh, I have, uh, I have two questions. Uh, my fir my first question is uh, my first question is uh, did the Turkish conception of Arabs as backward have an effect on the British opinions on the Arabs? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um the British definitely have different ideas about Turks and Arabs. They feel, I, my sense is in this period, they feel more of an affinity with Arabs. The type of British man, besides Gertrude Bell, who are going out, they in this moment feel almost a racial affinity with um, particularly Bedouin Arabs. Um, more than they do with Turks, who they see, I think, still more in that older kind of oriental uh, vein of, 
um, too passive, too uh, erotic, uh, corrupt, and that sort of thing, whereas Arabs are sort of manly, martial, clean in the desert, freedom-loving, that kind of thing. Um, so if anything, they're partial. The type, this sub-community of, of British officials are partial to Arabs. But it gets complicated because, especially when you get to the Palestine situation, and um, the views of different kinds of Middle Eastern people become, there, there's, there's often conflicting views between different British officials. But this subgroup that are going out to Arabia are going there because they're drawn to Arabs in particular. All right, uh, all right. so my second question is, uh, is in 1920, around the time when the air control in Iraq started, uh, uh, the, British used, uh, the British used air power uh, to successfully put out the Dervish Rebellion in Somaliland. Uh, uh, 1919, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah which, had la which had been a problem, which had been persistent for decades. Uh, they, and they sent uh, Mohammed Abdullah Hassan uh, fleeing uh, to the Ogaden. Uh, did that experience uh, influence uh, the British view of what air power could do? Yes, I mean, the, the, those, those brief uses of air control in 1919, and, and Somaliland is the main case, um, are, are what's partly what's informing this turn towards air control in Iraq, but it's also largely the fact that during the four years of the war itself, uh, they've used a lot of air power in Iraq. And it's, it's actually in the Middle East campaigns that air power is really fully developed. Things like aerial mapping, aerial photography, all of that, uh, even the first airlift, uh, they all happen in the Middle East. Um, so that's actually where, it's the Royal Flying Corps at that time, the RFC. But, um, so there's a, there's a kind of, uh, already an institutional kind of um, setting of the, of the Air Force there. So, but yeah, these other things do also happen and, and inform 19, the, what happens after 1920. Thank you for a very illuminating um, uh, lecture. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I guess my question is, what made them choose this different model of colonialism in Iraq than say what they did in, uh, and indeed were doing during this period in a country like India. Um, what, what were the conditions on the ground maybe that led to you know, this use of force, military force, rather than the whole uh, you know, colonial enterprise, the administration, the sort of recruiting of upper middle class uh, local people to form the kind of bourgeoisie that supported the enterprise, all of that. Why this different model of colonialism? Yeah, so I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I wasn't clear in the talk that um, my argument is that it, it is a, a question that we have to answer why, they, why air control is used first only in this place, right? And the explanation that I find persuasive is that the British have certain cultural understandings about um, this part of the Middle East. And somehow, even though many of these people have spent a lot of time on the ground there, they have this kind of imaginary of it as really flat, um, where a bird's eye view is going to offer like perfect visibility, and you'll be able to watch everything like a panopticon. And then there's a set of ideas about the people who live there and how they can take bombardment in a way that Bengalis cannot, right? Or even the Irish cannot. But later on, as I started out with saying in the beginning of the talk, the, about 10 years later, people look back on some of these words and say, that's absurd. You can use air control in many places. And then it is copied, slightly modified version of it in other parts of the empire as well. But still kind of broadly in what you might want to call Southwest Asia to the, the Northwest part of South Asia. It's like still broadly, it's Afghanistan, Palestine, Somali Somaliland, Iraq, Jordan, those places, yeah. France and Spain used it again yes, yes, France and Spain also use air control. They copy from the British. Yeah. Hello. Uh, so, over here. Um, I'm curious, uh, you were just talking about drones and uh, American involvement in the Middle East, and what's really interesting about 
uh, you know, our modern discourse on drones is how little of it there is in uh, popular media yeah. in America. I'm curious if you can comment on whether or not in Britain itself there was much discourse uh, about the use of um, the aerial force. Yeah. And if it's a similar ambivalence, um, can you comment on uh, what it is about liberal empires that, you know, separate the core uh, from the periphery in that sense? Yeah, so um, this is a really important point about air control. I think the discretion that it offers, right? Um, and that's part, part of what made it attractive as an option here because there was a lot more uh, assertiveness on the part of the British public. They want to know what's going on. They don't like hearing of uh, colonial violence. Uh, things like that become scandals. And um, some of the things I mentioned, there was censorship, there was restrictions on travel, they didn't decorate Air Force men. Um, it was, and they weren't even working that hard to collect statistics you know, on the logic that the statistics are always gonna be unreliable. And so this is not getting aired properly uh, at home. And then these radical backbenchers in the, in the House of Commons would sometimes ask questions and then people become, because they're not getting any information, they, they, they get um, you know, totally outrageous ideas of how do you know what anything could be true? Maybe T.E. Lawrence is doing something else nefarious somewhere else and you know, he becomes associated with all kinds of conspiracy theories about what the British state is trying to do behind its public's back, right? And I think the way uh, the, the advantages um, that people perceive, that uh, the military establishment would perceive in drones today are, are in some sense similar, that um, what they have done is actually shut down, because there's no cost to the American public, right? No American lives are at stake in it, first of all, uh, that we have, we have no debate about, about drones at all. Um, I was invited uh, to visit the drone air bases because I was writing on these things in uh, Nevada, and when I tried to write something about it, they, it was totally censored. They would not let me, they wouldn't even let me thank the Air Force in my footnotes. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if <clears throat> taking this uh, from a higher point of view, you could trace this air control from World War I when planes were first used militarily through operations like this, the Stanley Baldwin thing later in the 30s, the bomber will all get, always get through, to Bomber Harris, who'd seem to do anything he could to make sure the, the bombers did get through, uh, to uh, Vietnam, where the United States seemingly had the same kind of logic. It would be cheaper to bomb it would be easier to manage. We could turn it off and on. There wouldn't be a lot of uh, uh, men who are drafted who would be killed, although that didn't work out so well. But um, So this is actually at the beginning of a long infatuation with air power, which has never really delivered the goods that it's always been promised. Is this working or should I go back to the other? It's good? Okay. I totally agree with you. I mean, it's, it, this is a really interesting kind of mystery as well, that wh why this persistent use of a technology that demonstrably fails. And I think this is where myth is really important. The air ministry was very good at myth making about the success of air control, right? So that was a really important first data point um, that kind of created this um, mis misassessment, I guess, or misjudgment about how well this can actually work if you do it right, right? And then, I mean, even if you look at the case of the Blitz itself, when the British are bombed, it doesn't work, right? Morale just gets stronger. I mean, people come together and they become defiant when they're being bombed. Um, and yet, there is this persistent uh, use of it. Um, and I think, I mean, there are differences in the way Americans do it and the British have done it in the past. The American fetish becomes precision bombardment, right? So if we can just do it more surgically, more precisely, then we will get the kind of result we want. It's not really as much about morale in theory, whereas the British version was more about morale. So there are those kinds of sort of differences in 
uh, kind of strategic theory underlying it. But yeah, I do think um, lack of information, lack of public debate, mythologies around this, and to go back to a theme from the previous lecture, the military industrial complex also helps us understand why we engage in kind of t highly technological warfare um, permanently, you know, in some sense, because it, it's, it's, it's good for the economy. It's good for a, a lot of things. There's so many spin-off of, civilian spin-offs of drones. People praise them as, you know, they're going to cause the fourth industrial revolution and so on and on, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question in the formal part of the proceedings, but then uh, I'm sure you might be able to persuade our guests to answer questions if you have afterwards. Oh, um, so you talked in your uh, lecture about how um, the intelligence services in that period, um, people sort of I don't, I'd idealized or mythologized the sort of oriental mindset of the people in the Middle East. And I was wondering whether um, they did, had a similar sort of thinking about the peoples of like East Asia, what they would term the Far East, or whether, or whether I had a, maybe mythologized them in a, a different way, or how, how that sort of was similar or different for that sort of time? Yeah, um, I think at different times they, there may be some similarities in the way um, people of Southwest Asia and East Asia are mythologized by Europeans or even South Asia. I'm saying Southwest Asia instead of Middle East because that's really what we should be saying. But um, I hope that's not confusing. But I think in this moment, in this certain subgroup uh, of British uh, officials, there is a particular respect. Um, however, you know, racist it is, right? Uh, for the intuitive capacity, the mystical uh, knowledge making power of Arabs uh, who live in the desert in particular, not city Arabs, but desert Arabs. There is a kind of uh, fascination for those kinds of, uh, those, the, those people uh, in the Middle East. I think there is still um, more of a critical view of people in South Asia and the Far East, perhaps with the exceptions of certain subgroups within those places where they're seen as much more sort of dissipated and just, um, uh, what are the words, John, that I'm looking for? Just sort of um, exotic, erotic, you know, just uh, let, lassitude, passivity, laziness, all those kinds of oriental tropes. Um, but, but, but not these uh, manly men of uh, the Arabian desert. Okay? But it shifts in different times. Well, I think um, we will um, uh, break here. And I know um, we're all looking forward to Friday's lecture and hope to see as many of you there as possible. Uh, but first, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Satya for a great talk.